Good evening, everybody, and um, thank you so much um, for coming this Friday evening. Um, and thank you especially to those who were also here last night. Uh, we, we, we take that very well. Um, so it's my, it's my pleasure, um, as uh, the program leader of BMA Contemporary Art Theory, uh, to, to welcome you guys here, especially if you are on the course, and especially if you are coming in especially for this evening's edition of the Living Extinctions series. I'm aware that I'm a bit squeaky. Is it really annoying sound-wise? Shall I just move this back? Are we good? Yeah. How's this? If I just like one, two, one, two, are we good? That's, a, that's an up. Excellent. Thank you, audience. Um, right. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, our guest speaker. Um, and before I do that, I would just briefly say um, we'll have like a momentary pause, um, and like a micro pause between um, uh, lecture and questions, so that anybody who, who does need to, to leave can be discreet in their departure. Uh, and I can advise you that there is a rear door for your convenience, should that be necessary. <laughs> Um, and uh, with that, no, no, no more kind of preambles. So it's a pleasure to introduce um, Evan Kirksey, um, who, as you, uh, many of you will know, is an American anthropologist uh, who specializes in science and justice. Um, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, is, is currently hosting um, Evan in, the, in this academic year. Um, so we're really lucky that he was able to kind of tie in his kind of European um, visits with this one. Um, and at Princeton, he's currently uh, working on a project, a major project to do with gene editing, the innovation economy, and social equality. Um, he's also Associate Professor of Anthropology um, at Deakin in Melbourne, um, Australia. Um, uh, he's previously um, uh, been hosted by Princeton in the States. Um, uh, ooh, I can't read my own writing here. <laughs> Um, as the 25th, oh, it's, it's a long American title, that's what's thrown me. We, we, we just don't do this in the UK. <laughs> You're either like a doctor or professor. You, no one gets a, like a, a named title. But here we go with the 2015, 2016 Curry C. and Thomas A. Barron visiting <laughs> professorship. Um, and he's previously, previously served as the, um, as the convener of the Environmental Humanities kind of um, program at the University of New South Wales. Um, in Australia, which is, has been a, a source of um, a huge amount of really important work in the last um, kind of decade or so. Um, of his major publications, um, I've just named the three books uh, and one article that I know some of you here will have read. Um, of the books, there's uh, Freedom in Entangled Worlds, West Papua and the Architecture of Global Power from 2012. There is, and this is where I first encountered Evan's work, uh, multi-species salon, uh, an edited collection from 2014, uh, and there's also emergent ecologies from 2015. Um, and I also wanted to give a shout out to an article that uh, so I think a few of you have read here um, from 2018 on queer love, gender bending bacteria, uh, and life after the Anthropocene. So with no more uh, words from me, over to Evan. <laughs> So, so interestingly, that last article that, that Lynn mentioned was, was created here at Goldsmith. So I was here a few years ago uh, with Rosie Bergotti and Matthew Fuller, and we were thinking about the possibilities of life after the Anthropocene. And, and that piece is, is a more maybe multi-species take of, of what might be coming after the Anthropocene. Today is largely a human story. And it's, it's following a theme that, that cuts across many of my projects, which is, which is hope. And right now, I feel like we're in maybe a post-revolutionary moment with uh, Extinction Rebellion. We saw what happened yesterday as people targeted maybe a uh, infrastructure, a site, that was maybe a misplaced action. So, so today, I'm going to talk in a theoretical register about hope, but also invite you to think with me and imagine new political forms and new articulations that we might build together to imagine a life 
for the planet that might include people too. Um, so as thousands have been arrested with Extinction Rebellion in just the last couple of weeks, um, we've seen a shift in coverage in the media. We've seen a shift in um, some very specific government policies. We've seen figures of hope that once seemed distant on our imaginative horizons arrive in the historical present. But I, I think some of these micro-political shifts are woefully inadequate, given the scale of, of, of what we're living with. Does this sound OK? It feels like it's cutting in and out. It's not cutting in and out. It's just got a slight squeak, I think. Squeak? It's oh. it's Cutting in. I'll try to lean in. Is that, is that better? Ooh, and this moves, too. We can have a lot of fun today. <laughs> so right now, we see this groundswell of popular action. Again, some of it misdirected, some of it perhaps a bit ignorant about issues of race and class, and also some broader geopolitical sanctioned ignorances that I'm going to unravel today in conversation with some indigenous intellectuals from a place that many of you have probably never heard of. At the same time that we're seeing these small shifts in policy, climate change is outpacing all attempted solutions. Capitalist enterprises are rapidly destroying forests and wetlands in diverse corners across the globe. But I argue that these forces are, in fact, stoppable. We must not renounce hopes for a livable future. So, so Derrida has thought a lot about moments like these, and now I'm kind of shifting into a theoretical register. He insists that we must harbor hope, hopes that contain the attraction, the invisible elan, or the affirmation of an unpredictable future to come, or even a past to come again. He described what he calls messianicity without messianism. So messianism is connected to a messiah. You know, the messiah shows up, the world changes in some kind of radical way. He, he invited us to cultivate a hopeful spirit that's not attached to a messiah, that's not attached to even an event or a figure of hope. If hope does not have an object, Derrida reasons, it cannot be taken apart. It cannot fail. He was trying to claim a space for hope outside of the corrosive tools of deconstruction that he helped build. He was trying to describe this universal spirit that touches down in moments of history like the one that we're living through. But I'm making a different argument from Derrida today. I, I think that we should be very careful about what we hope for and the sorts of political actions that we take as a result of those hopes. Do we stop electric trains, arguably a technology and infrastructure that is part of the solution to global, global climate change? Do we stop electric trains in neighborhoods where communities of color are trying to get to work, where precariously employed people are stuck in time and space? Or do we read future figures of hope, different imaginaries of a world to come? So today I'm also asking, should we give up on hope in a moment like this, the day after an action that seemed really misplaced? And also against this backdrop of intense action that has failed to actualize expansive dreams. So you know, Extinction Rebellion emerges in a moment where people in many different walks of life are recognizing the enormity of climate change and the enormity of political and social and economic change that's necessary to deal with that problem. So we've made some small changes in the last few weeks, in the last six months, but we're nowhere near where you know, planetary survival might be possible. So again, do we give up when this moment fails to actualize expansive dreams, or do we appreciate what has changed and maintain an openness to the possibility of future changes. <laughs> I meant to show that a few moments ago. So in thinking about the scale of necessary change, I would like to invoke a recently departed friend and mentor. This is Deborah Bird Rose, who worked with me at the University of New South Wales. She, she died of, uh, of leukemia uh, late last year. Debbie taught me that death 
usually offers an intergenerational gift. When creatures die, they often open up new opportunities for life. Ecological communities, associations of predators and prey, omniv omnivorous scavengers, parasites and hosts, depend on ongoing intergenerational cycles of life and of death. The food web is premised on reciprocity among species. Even if many humans try to keep ourselves apart, whether that's with clean homes where we try to eliminate unwanted forms of life with poison, or if that's in death as we're embalmed to keep the processes of rot at bay, we can't ever completely prevent our bodies from becoming food for other species. Microbes on our skin and in our guts are constantly nibbling at our bodily boundaries. In death, as one of Debbie's close colleagues and friends also departed, uh, Val Plumwood, in death she notes that modern mortuary practices aim to keep us humans, at least these sufficiently affluent ones, very below the ground, below the level of soil fauna activity in a strong, strong coffin that's aimed at preventing other critters from digging us up. But even when the body is filled with toxic embalming fluid or burned, we can't resist giving something back in a material or elemental form to the worms or the land. Rot and decay are generative processes. So in thinking about Deb, she's recently departed, participating in these intergenerational gifts, I would like to scale up her ideas. So, so she described a process that she called double death. She described the poisoning of dingoes in Northern Australia, and she was interested in a very specific poison, 1080. So as the dingoes ate this poison, they died. And if you ate it, you would die too. Uh, it basically causes a long, slow, painful death with vomiting, with convulsions, drawn out over half a day. But if, if you die in that way with 1080 poison, your body's taken out of this intergenerational process of, of re-gifting life. So she described what she called chains of double death proliferating in these worlds. So as the dingoes died, their carcass became food for others. And those others died too, whether we're talking insects, whether we're talking other mammals, scavengers. So scaling up, we're living with these planetary processes of double death. You can easily see some in the carbon cycle with, with humans contributing CO2 to the atmosphere, but there's many other chains of industrial double death going on. Rachel Carson famously described DDT. We intervened. Earlier generations of activists and thinkers recognized those processes and stopped them. And now it's our time to grapple with these other cycles of double death and do the work of detourment, rerouting them creating that possibility for ongoing intergenerational gifts rather than a planetary process of double death, where death redoubles upon itself. So I'm thinking with other friends today, too. Tom Van Doren has, has written about uh, the unloved others and con conversation with them um, uh, about those who are, are disregarded in times of extinctions. Invertebrate populations are crashing now, falling nearly by half over a 35 year period. And again, that, that article that Len mentioned details more of what extinction looks like and what a post human future looks like from an invertebrate perspective. Um, I'm also thinking with uh, Beth Povinelli today. She talks about these things on a planetary scale. Again, if life and non-life usually exist in this dynamic relationship with gifts of energy and matter across generations, we must really pay attention as these processes of double death emerge within global systems. Beth describes this planetary trend of what she calls becoming unliving in her book, Geoontologies. Life and non-life breathe in and breathe out. If non-life spawned life, a current mode of life, the mode of life under industrial capitalism, might be returning that favor, spawning non-life. Plantation economies, capital flows, and global war are producing a massive, deadly becoming. 
forms of non-life are overcoming the living as geological forces, in Povinelli's words, turning their back on a world as it is being organized by becoming something that will potentially extinguish the world and the way we exist in it. I'll get to slow violence in a little bit from Rob Nixon, a colleague at Princeton, as, as well as Macarena gomez Barres' ideas from the extractive zone. But for a moment, I'd like to pause on the pronoun in that quote that I just read from Beth. Again, we're in, in this moment where we might extinguish the world in the way we exist in it. So that pronoun is really key. The word we, as many pronouns, can be slippery. It can exclude some. And I think in other parts of Beth's project, she's been very careful and expansive in creating a we that is lively and includes indigenous intellectuals. Her carving collective pictured here has been critical in thinking about how we must remember indigenous worlds that have already been extinguished. The key point is that the apocalypse has happened. It is happening for indigenous worlds. And in imagining a future white precarity, we must think with those whose worlds are already extinguished, those whose worlds are extinguishing even as we speak here today. So, so Maca Gomez Vares, who uh, book, book pictured here, The Extractive Zone, she invites us to think about how to build strong coalitions with indigenous intellectuals, to imagine together a future of planetary inhabitants and abundance. There's homogenizing tendencies under late capital. There's ongoing ecological and cultural destruction. And right now, imaginative labor in coalition with indigenous peoples is more urgent than ever. So I'd also like to push pause here and invite you to pause and think about the word that's wiggling within Anthropocene, anthropos. So in the same way that I want you to think critically about pronouns, who they include, who they exclude, I want you to think about who is included and excluded by anthropos, about the ethical and reasoning figure that Enlightenment Europeans conjured as their inheritance from ancient Greece. That's, that's where Anthropos comes from. And this idea has always excluded certain kinds of people. In thinking about figures of hope, again, maybe with Derrida and as uh, maybe distinguishing myself from Derrida, thinking, thinking about a future that's not empty of events or figures or even messiahs, but thinking about what's worth hoping for in a very careful ethical and political calculus. I think we should be dreaming about possible, possible futures in collaboration with others who have never fully enjoyed the legal and political privileges of being regarded as a member of this community, as part of Anthropos. <coughs> An end to the Anthropocene would not only mean an end to forms of industrial capitalism, these forces that are engendering double death on a planetary scale, it might also mean an end to the juridical legal tradition that relegates many people to the realm of bare life, treating them as subhuman, as killable. So I want you to meet Philip Karma. He's, he's a friend and mentor He's an indigenous activist from West Papua and an intellectual who was sentenced to uh, 15 years in prison for raising a flag. Karma has published a book in 2014 noting that indigenous people from West Papua, in his words, are often treated as if we are animals, animals that are in the process of evolving, of becoming full humans. Often Papuans are called monkey, he notes. In the same year that Karma published this book in Indonesian, Alexander Wilhey described much broader patterns in a book called Habeas Viscus, published by Duke in English. Wilhey describes how what he terms racializing assemblages divide up groups of people into full humans, not quite humans, and non-humans. People who are marked by these racial assemblages are routinely abused or killed. 
they have no standing before the law. Indigenous peoples worldwide have lived with racial assemblages that render them killable. And there's ongoing processes of displacement, dispossession, and genocide. So Philip Karma's from here, from Biak. Uh, it's a low-lying island off the north coast of West Papua, arguably one of the places that is going to experience sea, sea level rise and, and, and uh, the impacts of climate change well before the rest of us. And um, that imagined future is really not a big deal in Biak because there's other, so, so that's slow violence to again invoke Rob Nixon. Like the climate change is taking place over long periods of time. Uh, but what's happening in, in West Papua right now is actual real violence. Um, so, so two weeks ago, there was uh, a high school teacher in the highlands of West Papua, an Indonesian teacher. So just a quick geography lesson. You, you've probably heard of East Timor, got independence in 1999. This is Australia. This is the Indonesian archipelago. The capital is Jakarta. So was, Indonesia has a whole bunch of islands. West Papua is the biggest one. Um, so two weeks ago, an Indonesian teacher, and um, Indonesians have lighter skin, straight hair, uh, Papuans have darker skin, curly hair. A school teacher called a bunch of high school kids monkeys, and the students protested in the street. Hundreds, if not thousands, took to the street. Uh, the soldiers showed up, and they started shooting. And 20 students, 20 high school kids, were shot dead. So these kinds of sanctioned social, social like, like who, who'd actually heard of that story? Who knew that that happened? So I'd say 5% of people here know about this genocide that's, that's happening right now. Um, so, so there's lots of stories like this, but today I'm gonna to try to fill in some of this history that isn't widely, widely known. So West Papua declared independence on December 1st, 1961, and uh, three weeks later, the Indonesian military invaded. Papuan leaders were trying to get independence from the Dutch. Uh, this is formerly called Netherlands, New Guinea, um, but Indonesia invaded and forced, they forced all of those, those freedom dreams. Um, I first visited West Papua in 1998. I was a exchange student at the local university, and within two weeks of my arrival, it, it just so happened I was there during a time of intense political organizing. Uh, the campus where I was a student had a small protest, and it was on the sidelines of the protest. Uh, a flag was there, um, some chants were happening, but really low key. I saw a group of cops go by and saw their heads turn and notice that there was a protest happening. Um, a few moments later, I was running, and everybody was running. I ended up in a coffee shop along with some professors, and uh, we just carried on our conversation. It, it seemed like a carnivalesque scene, a little bit of fun we were all caught up in. Uh, then some popping noises started, and we said that it must be fireworks, continuing our conversation. But then there was a large explosion right outside of the coffee shop, and we dove under the table and, and hid for about a half an hour. Uh, when, when I exited, I learned that uh, two students had been shot. Uh, Stefan Suripati, a law student who was 21 years old, was shot in the head and killed. There was a middle school girl on the sidelines. Uh, she was shot in the leg, uh, lived, but still has difficulty walking. So I actually left, uh, I left the university. So that, that incident I described right there happened in the capital city, uh, Jayapura, and I was trying to get to the uh, sort of the uh, Siriwo River, which you can see right down there. I was working on an honors thesis about multi-species worlds, shall we say, um, but I got waylaid in Biak, the island that Philip Karma was from. So I didn't know who he was at the time, but when I got to the, the, the harbor, I just wanted to change boats. I took a big passenger ferry from Jayapura and I wanted to switch boats and head to Siriwo, but the harbor was occupied. The independence flag was flying on the water tower. Philip Karma had assembled a group of indigenous peoples um, who were doing nonviolent civil disobedience. They had raised the Morning Star flag for the first time in 40 years and had reached a standoff with security forces. They, they were there uh, for three days. Uh, local military commanders, civilian officials came to talk with them, trying to convince them to leave, but they, they said that they would stay, that they would 
uh, wait for um, a proper political dialogue. Uh, the order was given by uh, the uh, head of security for Indonesia, Wiranto, and while, while I was there, over the course of, of two days, uh, a massacre happened. So a number of people were shot outright, um, and then survivors were loaded onto ships. The ships went out into the ocean, they dumped people overboard, and uh, bodies started washing up later. A total <coughs> of 32 bodies later appeared on shore. <coughs> so right after that happened, I did do my honors thesis. I, I went to an indigenous village in, in the highlands of, of West Papua and uh, uh, studied multi-species worlds. I um, <coughs> ended up writing about the political violence. I wrote a PhD later in a book, but in this moment, I was interested in other stories. Um, along with Melanie and Agatha, pictured here, I, I learned um, about spaces of autonomy and freedom that might persist against the backdrop of an ongoing genocide. They, they lived by the side of the road. A, a, a logging company had just come in, clear-cutting part of the rainforest, but also opening up new ecological possibilities. So, so they were teaching me how to forage for food on the margins of market economies and the ruins of recently logged forests. They showed me how to exploit opportunities in emergent ecological communities. They also ta taught me how to find fleeting moments of happiness while collecting edible insects. Um, so these are some, some of the insects that I've written about. Uh, I basically uh, finally published my honors thesis, yay. Um, <laughs> So this came out in uh, uh, South Atlantic Quarterly, I think two years ago now. Um, so, so you can read about this story um, and a little bit about what I was just saying about um, the limits of the modern human in a juridical, legal, and theoretical register. So um, basically, along this road, lots of indigenous boys have been shot. And part of the pattern that I've described in West Papua is an ongoing a uh, situation of total impunity. So, so this is a place where those racializing assemblages mark certain kinds of people as killable. If you're an Indonesian soldier in West Papua, you kill a young black boy, and nothing happens. I've, I've seen, I've been watching this for more than 20 years, and the, the people who were just shot dead two weeks ago will not, will not see justice. Um, this, this piece also tells a story of that fragile bubble of hope that I just described along the side of the road imploding. Uh, Melanie and Agatha, they, they passed away, not from direct violence, but from the slow violence that happens on the edges of the modern world system where indigenous peoples are being pushed off their land by these oblique forces of, of, of timber, of also a inadequate health system where people don't have access to basic things like vac vaccines and antibiotics. So again, what I was trying to gesture to just there is the limits of Anthropos. Who gets to count as fully human in the Anthropocene? Where the juridical legal framework breaks down. You know, folks like Melanie and Agatha, Philip Karma and his friends, there's a long history of violence and dispossession and genocide in these spaces. Turning away from these constructions of Anthropos, again, that ethical and reasoning figure that is endangering planetary ecologies, I would like to bring you to another space of hope and speculation here in England. So shortly after I witnessed that massacre, a company that had paid uh, reportedly 100 million pounds to rebrand itself as Beyond Petroleum invited me to a gathering here in London. At the time, I was a student at Oxford, I was a Marshall Scholar, and I was working as an activist in collaboration with Amnesty International and a bunch of smaller NGOs you probably haven't heard of. Uh, one is called TAPL, the Indonesian Human Rights Campaign, another is called Down to Earth. So they were invited too, alongside, um, you know, we, us crusty activists were there along with investors, journalists, policymakers, and other people defined as stakeholders. 
And they were asking us if we should proceed, if they should proceed with an investment in West Papua. They called it the Tangu Project, a, a venture that promised to generate them more than 100 billion pounds of revenue. BP was uh, prophesizing a growth in the wealth for their shareholders, alongside benefits for indi indigenous people. So uh, you can't really, and I can't point properly. So Biak, where the massacre took place, is up there. Uh, Melanie Agapa uh, lived near Nabire, and the uh, the BP project is is in what's called the bird's mouth. So the island in New Guinea kind of looks like a cassowary, and that little bay right there, Bentini Bay, is often referred to as the bird's mouth. So with this Tangu project, BP promised again to improve the livelihoods of villagers, to bring development funds to West Papua, to bring tax revenue to Indonesia. Um, but at the same time, they were telling these tales in a speculative register, um, pointing to the promising futures the situation on the ground looked a little different. There were tales about these subterranean gas fields in this area, Bentuni Bay, and they'd been proliferating since 1996 when an American company called Arco began exploratory drilling. Basically, as the drilling was taking place, a bunch of babies died, and uh, the company tried to uh, say that it didn't involve them, that it was a measles outbreak, but um, you know, there, there were ideas on the ground that this was from some bubbling up of gas that was in, in, in the environment. Um, at any rate, the company failed to intervene. These, these children died, um, I believe, so 48 children in total. Um, they tried to dismiss that they had any responsibility again, um, but what they did substantiate were claims that this gas field was enormous by any standards, with other, over 12 trillion cubic feet of proven probable and possible reserves. BP took over this project from ARCO in 1999, and they acquired the gas field, and that's when they renamed it Tangu, an Indonesian word that means strong, hard to defeat, or unstoppable. They promised to do business differently than previous companies saying that they wouldn't repeat past mistakes. They claimed that they wouldn't be working with the Indonesian military and that they were a distinctive company. According to one of their brochures, we aim for radical openness, a new approach, transparent, questioning, flexible, restless, and inclusive. BP, in their broader marketing campaign, said that they were expanding investments in solar, wind, biofuel, and natural gas. They structured new promises around messianic dreams. Promises pinned to elusive figures of riches hidden underground, in the sun, in the air. The London meeting took place on Wentlock Road, a dead-end street with residential units, warehouses, a truck shipping facility, and similar meetings were taking place in the US and Germany. <coughs> there was a BP vice president, David Rice, and he asked that we keep our discussions off the record, invo invoking Chatham House rules. Um, but I noticed there was a recording microphone, an omnidirectional microphone on every table, so I uh, quietly started taking my own notes. I didn't start a recorder, but uh, you know they were saying that we couldn't repeat what was said in the room, but they were actively recording our conversation. So I started taking notes and later published on it. Um, among the promises that were made in the meeting, again, is that they wouldn't work with the security forces, citing this record of human rights abuses. At the end, after they served us uh, 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 some fancy, fancy food and drink, um, they asked us some questions. Is BP doing enough? How do we progress? Should we go ahead with the project? At my table, which again was with activists from Amnesty International down to Earth, we were skeptical. They claimed that they were gonna do a community-based approach to security but we'd seen time and time again companies coming in and getting entangled in these violent conflicts. We basically said when it came you know, to the public discussion that they shouldn't go ahead. At the same time, investors who were from socially invested, sorry, socially responsible firms, they said that it sounded great, that they should go for it. In concluding the meeting, BP's chief executives said that they hadn't yet made a decision. They hadn't decided if they were gonna invest billions of dollars in this project. They said, 
if there was something that would be damaging to the environment and our reputation, the project would be stopped. BP proceeded with the Tangu project despite our objections. Later I learned that up to 15% of the gas in this enormous deposit is carbon dioxide. That is, three trillion cubic feet of CO2 are under the ground here. Initially, BP said that they would capture the CO2 and inject it back into the earth. But then they were nigged, saying that it was too costly. Nobody's publicly reporting on the annual emissions from this site, but estimates by activists uh, suggest that BP is re releasing nearly 5 million tons of CO2 directly from the Earth's atmosphere every year, just from this plant. By burning the natural gas that is produced at this plant, BP is leading to the uh, release of more than 20 million tons of CO2 every year. So, by comparison, uh, the city of London every year releases about 30 million tons of CO2. At least that's the 2016 figure. That's the latest figure I could find. So this one plant that nobody's heard of in West Papua is almost releasing the same amount of, of CO2 as this whole city. At the same time, the proceeds from the BP facility were funding the Indonesian military occupation of West Papua. These are the political and economic relations that this site figures within. In 2018, BP paid 986 million in tax revenue to the Republic of Indonesia. BP began training, training their own community-based security forces, but this was under the command of Brigadier General Harianto, who had just left the Marines to start a private security firm. BP began using officers from Indonesia's feared mobile police brigade, or BRIMAB. This is a brigade that had been implicated in numerous human rights abuses. BRIMAB police launched Operation Sweep and Crush, that's their name, not mine, near the BP base camp in 2003. They executed and tortured to death at least eight people. And one of those people is in those plastic bags. So a 32-year-old man uh, named William Korwam, who was a, a community health worker, he worked in the local clinic, uh, was, was executed and cut up and put into those bags, which resurfaced a few days later. Um, I'm sparing you some pictures that are truly horrific, the, the, the worst, very worst crimes of, uh, against humanity that I personally have seen. I've, I've put them formerly within the US congressional record. They're also not published in my book, but if, if you want to read about them, I've described them with words. So amidst all this, power was functioning predictably up through April 10th, 2010. On that day, the Deepwater Horizon explosion happened in the Gulf of Mexico, leading to one of the world's largest environmental disasters. I'm just going to show some images. In Louisiana, as the oil was flooding into the Gulf, I met Jacqueline Bishop. She's an environmental artist who taught me how to find hope in blasted landscapes. I met Bishop through the Multispecies Salon, the art event that Lynn mentioned in the beginning. It's an, a, an exhibit that traveled from San Francisco to New Orleans before going to New York City. During a studio visit, Bishop showed me Trespass, an assemblage of floatsome and jetsome, baby shoes, bird's nests, toys, balls of twine, she created this five years earlier, an uncanny illustration of disasters looming on future horizons. She, she actually created this not only before the Deepwater Horizon explosion, but a few months before Hurricane Katrina. So I kind of read it as this uncanny premonition of disasters that she saw in the near future. Trespass is coated in a dark, glossy finish. It shimmers like crude oil. This artwork also uh, uh, sorry, 
At the first blush, from far away, trespass seems to be just a collection of floating trash, a dreadful rendering of disaster. When viewed from middle distance, it appears to dance about, like oil and water, moving in different directions, coalescing around a heterog heterogeneous collection of objects. If you move in and scrutinize this, this piece at close range, it reveals that it is populated with a multitude of hopeful figures. You see mushrooms, seed pods, bird eggs. These figures anchor hope in living forms. Like a bird's nest, this whole piece is built from scavenged detritus. Trespass nurtures, nurtures hopeful dreams. And I, I see a real, uh, so, so when, when you kind of shift back and, and go among these different scales, from the sea slick with oil and wreckage, an unfathomable disaster when viewed from afar, to these anchoring points for a hopeful desire, that can be grasped on a molecular level, I, I think it's a really good piece to think with um, in considering possible hopeful features. So, so one thing that I like about Derrida is that he makes a clear distinction between messianic and apocalyptic thinking. He, he insists that to, to hope for these revolutionary openings, one does not have to hope for the end of the world. That's sort of the apocalyptic. For him, messianicity without messianism is sort of waiting um, in what he describes as, as, as this uh, unfigured space. It's, it's a universal structure of feeling. Again, it's independent of a messiah. It's independent of a political project. It's independent of a religion. But it might touch down at any particular moment, opening up a field of political possibility. But Derrida, in his work, again, doesn't connect hopes to something specific. It's, it's, it's hoping for the unfigurable, the thing that is totally unexpected. He, he, he says that that's, that's where the revolutionary possibilities emerge. And, and I think when you don't hope for something specific, you get things like what happened yesterday, where your hopes land on something that's not well thought out, a, an action that, that you know, like, who knows what's going to happen outside of this room, but you, you can see a moment like yesterday kind of killing that social movement. It, it could implode. Um, so in thinking with indigenous, indigenous intellectuals from West Papua and artists like Jackie Bishop, I, I think it's very important to, to think clearly about very specific figures of hope. And, Figure is also a technical term as I'm using it today. A figure might be regarded as a fashioning, a resemblance, a shape, also a chimerical vision. This is Donna Haraway reading Nathaniel Bailey's Dictionarium Britannicum from 1730. To figure, Haraway reminds us, also means to have a role in a story. And in Trespass, I found this cautious messianic spirit searching through the refuse, coalescing around specific figures, then dancing away along other lines of flight. So Jackie knew what to do when the oil showed up in 2010. As many people sort of wallowed in the disaster, she rushed to the front lines. Um, she found that she couldn't care for those birds, that the, F, the uh, US federal government had very specific protocol for caring for mammals, for caring for birds, but certain kinds of life were falling through the cracks cracks outside of the imaginary of what is worthy for care. Again, if you go back to Agamben, there's this distinction between bear life, Zoe, and the life of bios, the life that has biography, that can have a biopolitical life. So these are hermit crabs. They were being shoveled by the BP cleanup crews into trash bags and thrown away in landfills. Jackie started using the skills that she developed as an artist to put oil onto canvas to work with Q-tips to take oil off these living creatures. She did a very simple intervention. She had Dr. Bronner's soap. She had water. Along the way, it, nobody kind of come up with a recipe for this. She kind of figured it out on her own in collaboration with, with a ranger named Leanne Sarko. They basically helped about 10,000 hermit crabs that otherwise would have been discarded as, as refuse amidst this disaster. 
As Jackie Bishop was doing that care work, other artists took to the streets. Uh, the crew of dead pelicans formed out of a Facebook event page. You had thousands of people taking to the streets doing what they called a jazz funeral for the Gulf. In New Orleans, there were these vibrant traditions that celebrate death. They were celebrating and mourning the loss of this ecosystem. Others had more direct messages. A, a competing protest group uh, that banded around the slogan, fuck BP, also started emerging in the streets. Amidst this vibrant aesthetic culture, this vibrant protest culture, high-level political meetings took place. President Obama summoned the executives of BP to the White House. After that meeting, Obama announced in a press conference that BP would be fined $20 billion. And that fine was unprecedented in US history and crippling to this company. BP at that time was making $17 billion a year, so this was more than their annual revenue stream. It was a serious blow. So this moment where you have artists imagining a revolutionary opening amidst the wreckage of a disaster, when you had people doing street theater, when you had collaborative politics that kind of cut across scales with world leaders stepping in and demanding a change, things shifted. Power was no longer functioning predictably. For me, it remains to be unseen or it, sorry, it remains to be seen if Anthropos is a tragic and myopic figure. Many of you here today likely agree with my diagnosis of contemporary problems, that distributed assemblages are inducing double death on a planetary scale. Life is becoming not life, other than life, and ongoing chains of destruction in precarious human and multi-species worlds. Blocking these toxic flows of death is critical to our survival and the survival of creatures that we love. Creating conditions of existence for these loved others, for others like birds, dolphins, hermit crabs, that involves making judgments about life and death on the basis of situated and contingent action. But even if we fail to save ourselves, which is a real possibility, and even if we fail to save the creatures that we love, I still have hope for life after the Anthropocene. With the help from another artist from the multi-species salon, Brian Wilson, I ground my hopes in a concrete figure, and that is the microbe. So, so Wilson brought me this, this small wooden box that had a blasted landscape inside. Uh, he said that this was after a nuclear holocaust, when People had basically destroyed eukaryotes, so that's plants, animals, you know, the, the forms of life that we relate to. But he said that this was a blank petri dish, right, for a reemergence, a new kind of flourishing. I think in the face of that possible future, it opens up an opportunity to think clearly about present conditions of life as well as future possibilities. So I read this as a counterpoint to some of Derrida's writings of hope, again, to come back to, to the central theoretical line. So Derrida regarded the future, in his words, as an abyssal desert. Rather than dream about the terrifying specter of a lizard, literal desert landscape on future horizons, Derrida suggests that we should literally expect the unexpected by waiting for mysterious possibilities that are beyond our imaginative horizons. The empty desert in Derrida's writing is devoid of all figures, again, empty of any objects of desire, literally expecting the unexpected. Waiting in a bleak desert, refusing to affix desires to specific programs of action, events, or political projects, he would literally have us harbor hope that is empty. In contrast to this contentless messianicity without messianism, this empty promise that goes nowhere, we've got to do very careful work. We've got to make sure that we're hoping for the right things. So 
So the multi-species salon, we found a hopeful spirit playing at the limits of our imaginative horizons, moving like oil and water, searching for figures around which movements might coalesce. Working with artists, we found prefigurations of livable futures. And we also looked at how people are often quick to refigure hope in moments like this, in moments when hope fails. So against backdrops of potentially bleak futures imagined by Brian Wilson, we found hopes being grounded by people and living beings and other agents already in our mix. In the conclusion to my first book, which is about West Papua, Freedom in Entangled Worlds, I invite readers to play the game of global futures. This is a game invented first by Anna Singh, um, and it is based on a relatively simple premise. Singh argues, unexpected connections make new things come into being, new technologies, new economies, new identities and political visions. Futures of all sorts are forged in the contingencies of strange connections. So Singh des designed this literal game, it's a storytelling project, and um, in the storytelling project you're given a secret mission. It could be create a revolution or corrupt a nation's government, <coughs> revitalize an ancient philosophy. And in my book I, I gave readers an alternate figure to think with about their, their, their visions um, and, and their missions. I, I suggested that uh, you think about taking over the tube. And in thinking about the tube, I'm both thinking about the specific infrastructure that channels natural gas around. I'm thinking about the pipelines that channel oil and other petroleum products around countries like the United States and Britain. I'm also thinking about, in a more abstract way, with An Antonio Benitez Rojo, about the assemblages that are perpetuating inequality in the modern <coughs> world system. So An Antonio Benitez Rojo characterized a sucking iron mouth that took things from the Caribbean and deposited them in Seville, Spain. Now we have a much more complicated architecture and infrastructure of inequality, but still, resentments are growing as inequalities intensify. This is a condition of, of late capital. And how might we think with indigenous intellectuals to take over this too? Like that's, that's, the, that's the mission that I leave readers with in this book. I also leave you with this image. Um, this came in my, my feed. I, I'm, like many of you, uh, getting the newsletter from Extinction Rebellion. So here's an indigenous man in an Extinction Rebellion protest holding West Papua's Morning Star flag. So I invite you uh, to join with me in imaginative and practical labor to accomplish a very specific goal. You know, what can we do together to shut down this Tangu natural gas plant in West Papua? I argue that that's a much better target of action than an electric train. What sort of unexpected connections and coalescences are needed to achieve something specific and surprising against broader decolonial and anti-authoritarian visions? Can we, and again, that's a slippery pronoun, but here I mean it today, as in the we here in this room, can we make personal and political choices to bring about a future of planetary inhabitants that makes room for indigenous peoples? Maca Gomez Vares insists that dreams of another world is not merely about a future-oriented utopia. Our dreams are already in motion, teeming with alternatives that we desire. So I invite you to find this person, you know? Ask him about his dreams. I don't know if this was taken here, some other European city, but ask him about the future-oriented utopia that he desires. I saw this yesterday as I was getting off the plane in Heathrow, and um, I also invite you to depart from BP's latest marketing campaign to see possibilities everywhere. <laughs> I invite you to imagine your own aesthetic interventions, your own political forms, to respond to the crisis at hand. And I also invite you to hold a number and a date in your head 
The number is 68,000 tons. Maybe just say that with me. 68,000 tons. One more time. 68,000 tons. So that's how much natural gas, sorry, that's how much CO2 is being released by that plant in West Papua every single day that we don't do something. Uh, again, about the same amount of pollution emerging here from London. And the date I want you to remember is December 1st. That's the anniversary of West Papua's Declaration of Independence in 1961. There's going to be an XR New York City action on that day. And I'm inviting people in London to consider joining in solidarity. So again, as earlier generations of citizens and scientists blocked the flows of double death in the 20th century with DDT, as activists in league with political leaders punished BP for earlier catastrophic actions. Now it is our time to interrupt new planetary cycles of double death. We must do careful articulation work. Again, not just Derrida's empty hopes for an unexpected future. We must make careful ethical and political calculations as we pin hopes on concrete figures and then do collaborative work to bring prefigured <coughs> desires into the historical present. And I'd also like to give you one more invitation. Me and a couple of friends earlier this week decided to write a new anarchist cookbook. So in the first anarchist cookbook, there are recipes to make bombs. So I invite you to think with us about what new forms of aesthetic and political intervention are needed in these times. You know, maybe you're going to write us a re recipe for a seed bomb. Uh, so I invite you to make proposals in what Beatrice da Costa calls tactical biopolitics. Offer us new ideas for flourishing amidst these legacies of racism, colonialism, and extractive capitalism. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Um, micro, micro break. Um, questions can percolate during the micro break. We can prepare our comments, our thoughts. If anyone needs to leave now, leave now. If anyone would like to go to the loo, go to the loo now. Um, so a couple of minutes and we will resume with our, our roving microphone.